Friends, grace and peace to you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we welcome you to this time of worship. If you're joining us here in person or on this 4th of July weekend when people are taking vacations, I know they're watching online, so we welcome you as well. It is always one of the highlights of my worship when we get to experience the leadership of the children of our congregation. So Abby, Sophia, and Georgia have very important announcements for you. And as we begin worship, Ms. Abby, what do we say as we bring the bread? This is Jesus' table of amazing grace. Perfect. <laughs> Ms. Georgia, would you pour in the water? And remind us who we are. We are the baptized children of the God. Amen to that. And Ms. Sophia, last but certainly not least. I'll trade you. Jesus is the light of the world, and he says you're the light of the world, too. Excellent. Georgia, Abby, Sophia, thank you so much for your leadership. As they return to their seats, I want to remind you that today is Communion Sunday, and during these awkward days of the pandemic, uh, we want to give you choice. So if you would like to stay in your seat, there are self-serve communion containers in the back. If you didn't get one and, and you want one, uh, you can go back during a song, but you're also invited to come forward to receive communion, um, and there'll be more instructions there. We just want you to do what is best for you. If you're worshiping from home, now is a good time to grab some bread and juice. Miss Shanna. Well, good morning. There's more of you than I thought there would be here this morning. It's great to see some people in person. So my first announcement is about some fellowship opportunities for you during the month in July, other than on Sunday mornings before and after church. This Tuesday, July 5th at 9 a.m., we have a men's breakfast. All men of all ages are invited to come to that, and Pastor Kevin will do a devotion and prayer during that time. And then Women's Fellowship is a week later this year because of Vacation Bible School, but on July 21st at 10 a.m., that's a Thursday, women of all ages come and enjoy a cup of coffee and maybe a few treats and just a really lovely time of being together. Next Sunday, July the 10th, immediately following worship, we're going to have what I think is going to be a very quick congregational meeting. Uh, one of our deacons moved to Ohio at the beginning of the year, and we need to fill Sandy's seat. So the nominating committee uh, is bringing forward the name of Ms. Lori Banner. Lori, would you wave back there? Uh, Lori has accepted the nominating committee's nomination, and it is our job to elect her or nominate someone else if that happens in the very weird, uh, uh, theoretically possible uh, polity of our Presbyterian Church. All that to say is after worship, a uh, quick congregational meeting to elect and install an elder for the class of 2024. VBS is almost here. We have a week left to finish our preparations, to have more kids register, hopefully, and to be ready on Monday morning, the 11th at 9.30 to come in here in the sanctuary and teach the kids about the love of Jesus and do some really fun things Monday through Thursday, the 11th through the 14th. We still have some flyer invitations at the Connection Center. Maybe you have some neighbor kids or grandkids or your own kids that haven't registered yet. Please take one of those and consider giving it out. One of the things I love about our church is that we're very active and involved in the community. And you have experienced rising prices when you go to the store. So imagine what those rising prices mean for those who live on the economic margins paycheck to paycheck. Every summer, 
Covenant puts together supplies and a backpack for local students in need where we can give a hand up. So we're asking you to participate in this annual drive where we support kids right here in the neighborhood. There's a supply list uh, at the Connection Center. Go ahead and pick one up if you're worshiping from home. Look in your Thursday update. But if you could help us serve over 100 students in West Ada and Boise school districts, we would be grateful for your support. Our last announcement. There were four students from Covenant who went to church camp this past week, two of which were the pastor's kids. And last night, one of those four students said, can we share with all the adults what we did at camp? And my heart melted and I said, absolutely. So I don't see the Wheeler girls here. Maybe they're still recovering from camp. But Levi and Laurel, would you be willing to come up and share with us a few things that you learned at church camp? Come, come on up. Levi and Laurel, can you tell us a little bit about your time at camp? Maybe a fun meal and something that you did that was really fun. Um, I think the best meal was probably spaghetti. Spaghetti? I thought you would say s'mores, but Dad will take spaghetti. Um, I think the best meal was pulled pork sandwiches. Excellent. And what was something fun that you did this past week let's come over here closer to the camera beach day beach day lake alturas in the mountains doesn't get much better than that sockum sockum this is a cool game that you should learn how to play and last question uh, as i look out at the reverend bob braun who was one of the first directors at camp luther heights uh, he was what Ms. Kelly does now. So for Bob and everyone's sake, can you share with us something that you learned about God this week? I learned that God was always forgiving. God is always forgiving. Um, I learned that God was always forgiving. Excellent. Our God loves all of the children of God so much that he will forgive you. Laurel and Levi, thank you so much for sharing about your time at camp. Dad's heart is very proud right now. Let's come to the Lord in a spirit of prayer. Almighty God, we do thank you for your forgiveness, your constant calling us back into the family, reminding us that you love us so much that you're willing to die for us. So Lord, thank you for camp, thank you for the family of faith, and during this hour of worship, we pray that once more you would speak to us your holy loving words, calling us into the fullness of our being. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand and sing our first hymn together, hymn number 340, This Is My Song.
Friends, if we say that we have no sin, the truth is not in us. And the Bible says that the only person you're deceiving is yourself. But John says that if we confess our sins, that God who is faithful and just will forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In a spirit of humility, I invite you to pray the prayer of confession found on the screen behind me. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to into your holy name. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the good news of Jesus, that while we were still in our selfishness and brokenness, God loved you so much that he came to be with us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, teaching us the ways of the kingdom of God. And when the powers of the world were threatened by his message of good news, of love and reconciliation, and the evilness of the world crucified our Lord on a cross, God continued to love me and you and the entire cosmos so much that overcoming the power of death, overcoming the power of hell, Christ rose again in victory to show me, you, and all of creation that if we would simply put our trust not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ, we can be certain that our sins are forgiven and the path to eternal and abundant life lie close at hand. Amen? Amen. Friends, you may be seated. Well, good morning again. In Kids Church, we have been spending time with Abby, the bee, learning a little bit more about bees, but mostly learning that Jesus is for everyone. That's our Bible point for four weeks, and I think a good Bible point for all of you also. So let's say it all together. Jesus is for everyone. We're reminded in Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Today, we're going to remember what a light Jesus is by doing our song, Jesus is the Light. So everyone up and do it with us. Come on, clap your hands. Here we go. That's it.
everyone nice and tired, Kevin, so they'll sit quietly during the sermon. <laughs> all right. All kids four years old through fifth grade, we're going to kids' church, and then we're coming back for communion today. So how do we go to kids' church? We march in English. on the overhead screen or on page 392 in the Pew Bible. Let us pray. Our God and Lord, now as we hear your word, fill us with your spirit. Soften our hearts that we may delight in your presence. Sharpen our minds that we may discern your truth. Shape our wills that we may desire your ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Psalm 30 from the New Revised Standard Version Updated Edition. Thanksgiving for recovery from grave illness. A psalm. A song at the dedication of the Temple of David. I will extol you, O Lord. For you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O oh Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O oh Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life, and among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. The word of the Lord. Friends, as I look around the sanctuary this morning, I am reminded that this community is full of exceptional individuals. I see folks with advanced degrees who have done much in the life of education. I see uh, other ministers who have given their lives in service to camp and to the presbytery and hospitals. There are folks here who show up every week to clean the toilets and rake gravel so that we can enjoy a beautiful space. Um, so I want to tell you about one of these exceptional individuals. And who knows, maybe you'll show up in a sermon a few years from now too. On this Independence Weekend... 
I am mindful of Larry Richards, my friend and a teacher who served his nation with honor in the 1950s, serving in the United States Navy. But after fulfilling his service to his country, Larry and his young, vibrant, beautiful wife, Evie, packed up and went to Atlanta, Georgia, where Larry embarked on some studies at Columbia Theological Seminary because they had heard the call of Jesus in their life. And over the course of their career together, my friend Larry graduated with a seminary degree. He spent a few years ministering in the United States, but quickly learned that Maybe Americans are boring. I don't know. I, but God called him and Evie and their family to service, spreading God's love, not to Hawaii or the Bahamas, but to Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, places where we would not ordinarily go for a short-term mission project. They spent years, decades, serving God's people in a place where Christianity was not necessarily part of the culture. Friends, this congregation is full of exceptional people, and Larry and Evie have taught me a lot about evangelism, and when I saw Evie yesterday afternoon, she has a message for you and for me, and I'll share that at the conclusion of our sermon, because at Covenant, we have been talking about evangelism. Larry and Evie have been good teachers, but how do we, in our American culture, where, let's be honest, Fewer and fewer people are going to church. People in my age category and younger, even more they're not going to church, but I bet you can find a lot of them hiking in the Boise foothills this morning. So what does it mean for the church of Jesus Christ to go and to share the good news? Our scripture passage today comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20 where Jesus talks about what it means to go and share. Sisters and brothers, listen for the word of the Lord. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. And Jesus said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, they are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. I am sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals. Greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on that person. But if not... It will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who were there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest of you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazon. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Indeed, at the judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, 
Will you be exalted in heaven? No. You will be brought down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Time passes. Verse 17. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even in your name, in your name, even the demons submit to us. And Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. Indeed, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My friend, my teacher, Larry Richards, went to be with the Lord on Wednesday. He had lived a long life in service, faithful service to the Lord. And as I gathered with this missionary family to talk about what this service would look like, I heard stories that baffled my mind. <clears throat> I want to share one with you that I shared at the service yesterday. So the Richards family, with small children, uh, had just been expelled from Iraq by the Ba'athist government that had taken over the Christian school that they had run, and they had been sent out of the country. They went to Beirut, Lebanon. And while they were there, the Iraqi government knew exactly where Larry was, where he was staying, his phone number, and called him up and said, Larry, we have no idea how to run the school for girls. Will you come back and run it for the government that just expelled you and your family for our country? Well, before they went back, they wanted to take a tour uh, to a church in Syria. And if you know this, uh, the story of the world in the 70s, 80s, 60s, uh, violence is just a normal part of the culture in the Middle East. So the Richards family, they are driving over to Syria, and the kids who are like in elementary school at the age uh, where they're traveling, they said, oh, and do you remember that Israeli helicopter and how we saw the missile fly up out of the sky while we were in our car destroying the Israeli helicopter? And then all of the Syrians coming forward, because there's a bounty on Israeli heads, coming forward with their guns and how we just simply drove out of there that day. We were listening to the radio. The Israelis were sharing on the radio about how they were decimating the Syrians. The Syrian radio station was celebrating how they were taking evil Israeli aircraft. And the BBC radio station was simply reporting that there had been reports of violence that day. So they drove to the border, which at this point is closed, miles from their home. This missionary family on a land hostile to Christians, where the Richards were simply bringing the message of love and peace. They had been sent. What were they going to do? So Dr. Richards gets out of his car. And he walks up to the border security. Says, my name is Larry. I am a Christian missionary. How are you today? And the kids say, I don't exactly remember the refrain of the conversation. But by a miracle of the Lord, the border guard lifted open the gate and sent the family back to Beirut. 
And they said, do you remember that? A miracle in the midst of violence. I share this story with you, my friends, because as we remembered Larry's life yesterday, Larry lived a life of adventure, but we described him as joyful, as fearless. And the kid said, you know how I think that the border guard led us through? Well, all of those Middle Easterners respect men of the Lord, whether they're Muslim or Jewish or Christian. And dad had a good beard like a good godly man. And you know what? He simply loved them. The Richards family knew that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But today, my friends, we live in a world where I wonder about where we send missionaries. Researchers tell us that the underground church in China is exploding. Christianity today in the global south, in Africa, in South America, is growing. But if we look at the numbers for the historically Christian West, the numbers of practicing Christians are going down. And I wonder if really... The place that needs missionaries is right here in our homes and in, in our neighborhoods. And I think that we can learn from Larry, who learned his ministry from Jesus, right here in this passage that we just read today. So if you have your Bibles, keep it open to Luke chapter 10. I'm going to pull out some nuggets of text that I think can be helpful. If you are interested in a life of joy and in a life of authority where even the demons or border security guards will yield to you. Look at verse 1. It's verse 2. The disciples are sent with the gospel. God was doing something new in the person of Jesus Christ, saying that the kingdom is not found in the temple, but the kingdom of God is at hand and it's coming near in the person of Jesus. And Jesus didn't say, sit in your synagogue, listen to the rabbi, and people will just come. No, Jesus, over and over throughout the gospels, are saying, disciples, go, because we've got good news to share that the kingdom of God is right here in our midst, and the people need to hear this word. So the first thing that we can extrapolate from this is that God's people are sent with good news. Verse 4 is always very intriguing to me. Don't take a sandal, don't take a purse, don't take a tunic, don't even greet anyone on the road. Commentators will say that little line in verse 4 about not greeting anyone is a note about the urgency of the message. We don't have time to lose this good news. People are desperate, hungry for it. So don't get caught up in conversations in the lobby about your golf game last week. Go and share the good news. But here's what I pull from this, which probably doesn't bode well for uh, any capital improvements we may be doing at church, right? But simply, this is good news. You don't need much. You don't need a seminary education. You don't need a fancy Lexus. You don't need a big fancy building. Just simply go with yourself with this message and say, peace, I bring you peace. Peace. Now, friends, I want us to ask the questions about Christianity in America today. Sometimes we get a bad rap that we're not very nice, and sometimes those criticisms are true. But quite simply, Jesus says, go share peace. Share that the kingdom of God is near. This is your message, my friends. Not hating the other side. Peace. The kingdom of God is here. You don't need a whole lot to do that, my friends. And when those disciples are welcomed, their message is twofold. Because so often we get caught up in, oh, the gospel is just material goods or it's just physical. No, Jesus is saying here and elsewhere, if you read the scriptures, that this good news is both 
physical, material, and spiritual. Jesus says, go and cure those who are sick. Attend to the physical needs of the people you encounter. This is important. And remind them that the kingdom of God, which speaks to the heart and the soul, remind them that that is very near because our Lord knows that the kingdom of God is all-encompassing. Flesh, blood, yes, Heart, soul, spirit, yes, the kingdom of God is all of that. But then we get down to verse 10 through 16. And Presbyterians are notoriously polite folks. We don't like to offend people. So when we read this section of Scripture, we're like, oh, Jesus does not sound very nice here. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you, Chorison. It is important for me to share with you that we don't just gloss over text we don't like, but we dig deep into it to see what the Lord is saying to us and how we live that scripture in our lives, how we understand it. So if you don't, if you're not super comfortable with verses 10 through 16, I want to say two things. One, I feel you. Number two, I believe this text is speaking to the reality, the pain that sin causes in this world. We don't have to look very far to see sin manifesting itself in our own midst. Uvalde, Texas. The current stream of political discourse in our society. Evil. Hardness. Divisiveness. Paul says that the wages of sin is death. We see this unraveling around us. And why is it unraveling around us? Because people are walking away from Jesus' message of peace and that the kingdom of God is here. And people are saying, oh, I know how to run this world. I know how to live my life. I'm going to do what I'm going to do and choosing the me over the we. And every, every time that that sinful nature takes over us, takes over our culture. Woe to us. And I wonder if a 2022 reading might have Jesus saying, woe to you, those who live in the global West, thinking you can do this life all on your own without me. Woe to you. Are you with me? These are hard words. But I find that they are real words. And until our nation takes seriously this message of peace and the kingdom of God, I hesitate to say this, but I think it's true. We will see more evil in our culture and in our land until we return to the Lord. People need to hear this good news. Am I right? Two more items that we pull out from the text. The disciples had been sent to share good news, quite simply evangelism. So they did it, and at first we don't know whether they were happy to do it or excited to do it, but we know that they went. But when they returned, Scripture tells us that they came with joy, and they discovered that they had power and authority. And friends, I want to lift up Larry's life to you once more, because as he went to deep, dark places proclaiming this message, Larry found a great sense of joy in following his Savior, and he learned that in the name of Jesus, he had authority over Palestinian border agents. He had authority to walk into churches in Baghdad and in South Carolina and say, folks, we may disagree, but the Spirit of the Lord is going to bring us together. 
when we go out with the message of Christ, we find joy and power. And in verse 20, lastly, we find that we rejoice not that we have power, but that we're part of something bigger, better than ourselves. Jesus says, rejoice that your names are written in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, that we would go through life knowing the security, the joy, having spiritual power in this world. And friends, we may not be sent to Baghdad and Iraq, but we do he live here in Boise. We live wherever we are watching online. And Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. There's a half a million people in this valley, and I wonder how many of them needs Jesus. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. But the workers, they are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest. As I say that prayer for covenant, I invite you to ponder whether you would pray that for yourself. Friends, we have the opportunity to live lives of adventure of joy, of hope. And if we go down this path of sharing the good news, let's just simply do the first thing that Jesus tells us to do. To pray. And on our day of judgment, may Jesus look us in the eye and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let us pray. Lord, we live in a growing area. Lord, we love our Treasure Valley. Lord, we recognize that our neighbors need the good news. And when we are painfully honest, we know that we, I, need the good news. Be with us, we pray. We do pray that you would send laborers into the harvest, and we wonder if that would be me. So, Lord, grant us the courage and the bravery to go forth, to answer the call, to share the good news. And may we find adventure. May we find authority. May we find joy. We pray this in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together our next hymn, Taste and See, page 520. Good morning, Covenant. Uh, this hymn may be unfamiliar to some of you, so the words will, as usual, be on the screen behind me, or as Kevin said, you can find it in your Glory to God hymnal, number 520, Taste and See.
you may be seated. As we come to our time of the offering, it takes dollars to run a church. So consider what God may be calling you to give. But more important than the dollars, God wants all of you, not just 10% of your heart, all of your heart. So during our offertory meditation, I invite you to ponder how God may be calling you to share the good news. Friends, in the back of the sanctuary, there's an offering box. You can place your offering. If you're worshiping online, you can give online. But ask the Lord how God can use you to share the good news. Let us remain standing as we affirm together our faith, uh, faith of so many Christian tribes using the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And we will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. As we prepare to celebrate the sacrament of our Lord Jesus Christ, I remind you that this is not Kevin's table or Covenant's table. We believe that this is Jesus' table. And we believe that if you are searching for God's grace, that you, you are invited to come and partake. Scripture tells us that on the great day of the Lord, people will come from north, south, east, and west to feast at the heavenly banquet table. Friends, in a spirit of prayer, let us turn our hearts to the Lord. Lord, thank you for the children coming in to join us. Remind us that your kingdom is from cradle to tomb inviting all of your children to come forth to partake. Lord, we thank you for this day, for this church, for your saving acts in our life. Lord, we pray once more that you would pour your spirit over this ordinary bread and ordinary juice, that for us it may become extraordinary, being the communion of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, nurture our hearts that we may go forth boldly to proclaim the good news we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, we gather and we remember that meal when Jesus was with his disciples. And he took the bread and he did something new. After giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this bread, this bread is my body broken for you. And whenever you eat this broken bread, do this and remember me. And in the same manner, he took the cup. And after giving thanks to God, he poured it out and gave it to his disciples. And he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And whenever you drink of this cup, do this and remember me. Paul says every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's saving death until he comes again. At this time, I want to invite our servers to come forward and a few matters of traffic control. If you choose to come forward, there will be two stations. We'll create two lines down this center aisle. We'll invite you to come forward. You'll receive a cup with a piece of bread in it. You'll receive a cup with some juice in it. After you partake of the elements, you'll find a receptacle for your container. So if you would choose to just stay in your seat with those self-serving packets, that is terrific. If you're one of those people who are thinking, I just don't know about this communion thing yet, but would like to come forward and receive a blessing, I will be here and I'll be glad to give you a blessing in the name of our triune God. After you've come forward, you'll return to your seats in these two outer aisles here. And I think that I'm covering anything. Dana, did I forget anything? Church is a place of grace. So if I or you mess up, we're still going to love one another at the end. Amen? Well, friends, uh, our elders are ready. Friends, this is the feast of the Lord for the people of God. As you are ready, you can come forward.
to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Spring.
friends, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this meal. We thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the opportunity to share the salvation we have in you. Grant us, we pray, the courage to go forth boldly, to live as people with true freedom, to love deeply, to work for peace and the reconciliation in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for our church that would, we would take seriously this call to evangelism. We pray for our children and we love their noise in the sanctuary. We pray that we would be a church that allows them to grow strong and healthy in faith. Lord, be with us, we pray, with those that grieve, with those who are ill. As we come upon the nation's remembrance of our independence, may we lead lives as citizens worthy of the sacrifice of those soldiers, of those who have worked for our republic. We pray that we would work to be a city on a hill. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and sing together our closing hymn. Number 346, for the healing of the nations. Friends, Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So I invite you to pray that the Lord would send his laborers into the harvest and that we would go boldly proclaiming the freedom that we find in our Lord Jesus Christ. And as you do so, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.